Mr. Majeski's Anatomy 32 class lecture. Chapter 10, part 1, the muscle organs, the fibers, and signaling. So this should bring flashbacks from chapter 3. We have three different kinds of muscle tissue. Skeletal muscle tissue, cardiac muscle tissue, and smooth muscle tissue. As I'm sure you remember, skeletal muscle tissue is attached to bones and sometimes skin to allow for movement. These cells are very long, cylindrical, and multinucleated, so they have many nucleuses, and they have very obvious striations. Then there's cardiac muscle tissue. It's found, well, in the walls of the heart. Makes sense. It is often chains of branching cells with one or two nucleuses. It also possesses the striations, and it also has intercalated discs between the junction points of two cells. And then finally, the smooth muscle tissue. It is found mostly in hollow organs, such as the stomach, respiratory tubes, so forth. Um, these cells are long, single cells. They have one nucleus, and they do not, do not possess striations. So what are the functions of muscle tissue? Well, there are four. Uh, one is producing body movements, usually across joints, moving bones. Uh, also for stabilizing the body position. We are continuously making minor contractions in many of our uh, back muscles and neck muscles to hold our posture, whether it's good or bad. Also, uh, muscle tissue functions in storing and especially moving substances within the body. After all, that heart pumping is moving that blood all throughout our body. And finally, producing heat or thermogenesis. Muscles contraction to generate heat, and that's what gives us our body temperature. Some properties of muscle tissue. Well, one important property is electrical excitability, which means that in response to a stimulus, the muscle will produce what's called a muscle action potential, which is basically a slight charge differential that will flow along the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. And we will be talking about that in more detail. Next is contractility, the ability to shorten and in the process generate tension so that the muscle is able to use that force to move something, basically what it's attached to. So in the picture below, move, lifting that uh, dumbbell. Extensibility, muscles are able to stretch without being damaged, within reason. Like the rubber band shown here, you can stretch it to some extent. And like rubber bands, muscles have elasticity, which is the ability to return back to that original shape and size after being stretched. So let's focus on the skeletal muscle as an organ. So as you see here, the main parts of a skeletal muscle include the muscle belly, where the bulk of the muscle tissue is located, and the tendon, which then attaches the muscle to the bone. And you see, when you look down into the muscle belly, that it is composed of bundles referred to as fascicles. And within these bundles are muscle cells, which in the world of anatomy is often referred to as muscle fibers because the cells are so long. So, as you go down histologically, looking at smaller and smaller structures in a muscle organ, you see that really the muscle is a bunch of bundles of bundles that are then bundled up. It can be a little confusing when you're looking at these red pictures and seeing red structures that all look kind of similar, but hopefully my explanation will help clear it out. So we start off at the top with the big muscle organ itself. And we see within it lots of bundles. These bundles are referred to as fascicles. And if you take a close-up of a fascicle, you see that it has lots of little bundles in it, as well as uh, what are called neurovascular bundles, where you see the arteries, veins, and somatic nerve neurons entering and leaving the cell, uh, the organ. Sorry. So, the things that are bundled up inside a fascicle are the muscle fibers themselves. And then, if you look at a muscle fiber, you see that it has, has many, many rod-like structures inside it, referred to as myofibrils. And these are bundled up inside the muscle fiber. And then the myofibril itself is actually bundles of protein filaments. So, you've got bundles of protein filaments forming myofibrils. These bundled myofibrils are within the muscle fiber. These bundled muscle fibers are within a fascicle, and these bundled fascicles make up the belly of the skeleton, the little muscle. Also within skeletal muscle is lots of connective tissue. 
So you'll find that around each muscle fiber is a thin wrapping of reticular connective tissue called the endomycium. Then surrounding each fascicle is another layer of connective tissue, this time dense irregular connective tissue called paramycium. And then from there, around the muscle organ as a whole is another layer of connective tissue that's also dense irregular connective tissue called epimyosome. And what's amazing is these three layers of connective tissue, the endomycium, the paramycium, and the epimycium, all fuse together to form the tendons at either end of the muscle organ. So that really, this connective tissue structure of the tendon is continuous throughout the entire muscle organ. And then the tendons, of course, attach to the bone. And not only is the tendon continuous with the periosteum, the outer layer of connective tissue on bones, but the tendon sends collagen fibers into the bone tissue itself, making for a very strong attachment. So what are some of the primary functions of this connective tissue? Well, obviously, it helps to connect bone muscle. I'm sorry. Obviously, it helps to connect muscle to bone. Also, it limits extensibility because, after all, the muscles can stretch, but only to a point. It helps bind the muscle fibers together within the muscle organ, and it also allows for limited movement within the muscle organ. This is important because not all of the cells in the uh, muscle organ are going to contract at the same time or to the same extent. So they're able to rub against each other a little bit without causing damage. So the anatomy of the muscle fiber. Well, back when you were an embryo, you had many myoblasts. These were progenitors to the muscle cells. And many of those myoblasts then fuse together, thereby forming a skeletal muscle fiber. That's why a skeletal muscle fiber has many nucleuses inside it. Also, what forms is cells called satellite cells. These are basically muscle stem cells that can help repair a little bit of damage to the muscle organ. So now let's look at the muscle fiber closely. To start with, we see that directly underneath the endomycium is the sarcolemma. Normally, we would call that the plasma membrane, but in muscle fibers, it's called the sarcolemma. And then the fluid inside the muscle fiber is called sarcoplasm. Normally, we'd call it cytoplasm, but the sarcoplasm is slightly different in that it has high amounts of gly glycogen, which can be broken down into glucose and used as an energy source. And it also has myoglobin, which, like hemoglobin, is both red and it binds oxygen. And that oxygen is needed for the energy production within the muscle fiber. And then we have these long rod-like structures we've, uh, called myofibrils. And these are actually the contractile element of the muscle fiber. So this is what will shorten when the muscle contracts. And here is another picture of the muscle fiber. And here you can see a, another um, key factor of the muscle cell, which is that you have these little uh, invaginations of the sarcolemma, which basically form these tunnels that will go all the way through the muscle fibers uh, body and wrap around the myofibrils. And these structures are called transverse tubules. And since they actually are basically contiguous with the outside, they are filled with interstitial fluid. And the purpose of these transverse tubules is to help speed up the muscle action potential by bringing that current flowing along the sarcolemma into the body of the cell and next to the myofibrils. You also see this sort of, well, in this picture, orange structure. This is called sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it is actually uh, similar to endoplasmic reticulum. However, its structure is slightly different, and it encircles the myofibril structures. And the purpose of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is to store calcium ions. And as you can see, the uh, transverse uh, tubule is, runs in between two adjacent sarcoplasmic reticulum structures. And where the terminal cisterns of the sarcoplasmic reticulum abut against the T-tubule, or transverse tubule, you get a structure referred to as a triad. 
and it's again worth emphasizing that the sarcoplasmic reticulum stores calcium ions, which are then needed to trigger the muscle to contract. So how does that signaling really work? Well, we start off with the axon of a somatic motor neuron. So we're getting a signal from our nervous system saying, hey, muscle, contract. That signal or nerve impulse will then flow down into the axon's terminal ends, finally ending up at a synaptic end bulb. And that synaptic end bulb will interface with the sarcolemma of the muscle cell, forming what is referred to as the neuromuscular junction. And if you take a close-up of this neuromuscular junction, you can see that the synaptic end bulb possesses lots of what are referred to as synaptic vesicles. And within, within these vesicles is the neurotransmitter acetylcholine that can signal uh, contraction in a muscle. And where the uh, synaptic end bulb interfaces with the um, sarcolemma is referred to as the motor end plate of the muscle. And this is a very specific spot on the muscle and then you can also see that there's this synaptic cleft. There's this space between the synaptic end bulb and the motor end plate. So when that neural impulse reaches the synaptic end bulb, it will trigger the synaptic uh, vesicles to release acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft. The acetylcholine will then diffuse across that cleft and reach the motor end plate. There it will bind to acetylcholine receptors that are within the sarcolemma of the muscle cell. When this happens, sodium ions, which are positively charged, will flow into the cell, thereby changing the uh, electrical composition on each side of that uh, sarcolemma, thereby starting the muscle action potential. And that muscle action potential that is produced will then flow along the uh, sarcolemma, eventually reaching the T-tubules and triggering a contraction. Eventually, the signal, the nerve impulse, will stop being received, acetylcholine will stop being released, and an enzyme will come in and break up the acetylcholine that is present so that the signal will stop being sent. And I like to think of the muscle action potential as sort of like the wave, so that if someone's at a um, stadium and the cheerleader runs along and everyone stands up and waves their hands in the air, so the wave starts at the motor end plate, when the sodium floods into the cell, thereby switching the charge so that you now have a negative charge on the outside of the cell and a positive charge on the inside. And that'll flow down the length of the cell, sort of like the wave going through the audience, until finally, blah, finally it ends. So here you can see how the muscle action potential is going to go from the motor end plate along the surface of the sarcolemma and eventually into the transverse tubules. When it goes through the transverse tubules and reaches where the transverse tubule abuts the um, sarcoplasmic reticulum, the sarcoplasmic reticulum will then release its calcium ions. And this will eventually trigger a contraction. So that's it for this part of our lecture on muscles.